Hey everyone, welcome to Cannabis Technologists. I'm your host, Rob Neely, and with me today is uh, the founder of uh, Sun Grown Zero, John Perricone. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing very well, Rob. It would be uh, 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 be it would behoove me to mention I'm the co-founder of Sun Grown Zero. My partner and scientist, Jonathan Cachet, PhD, is the uh, the sort of uh, Einstein that brainstormed this technology into an operating system. Um, my background is more of a, I was an outdoor cultivator in Humboldt for almost uh, 17 years. Uh, and okay. Jonathan and I partnered up because I saw synergy in the way we both looked at energy efficiencies. Cool. Well, thank you for correcting me on that. Because I watched the video and, and got to see Jonathan uh, doing his thing. And I'd like to direct our viewers to that later. Um, I'll start with kind of giving high level very quickly, and then we'll we'll get into some questions. Um, as far as, as, as I know with Sun Grown Zero, um, it's essentially a, a DSS cultivation system, and I guess DSS is hybrid dynamic supplemental sunlight. Is that right? Hmm. Um, well, you know, Sun Grown Zero is basically a revolutionary new hybrid lighting technology solution. It's a facility design that incorporates uh, the solar tube uh, sky vault technology to bring the full spectrum and, and impact of the sunlight into the room while reflecting all of the heat away. Um, the DSS uh, Sun Grown uh, that you're mentioning, that's just the name of the company that Jonathan had when he was doing the research. The technology itself is a hybrid lighting facility design that Jonathan created. And basically, he created a, 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 an intelligent grow management uh, program around bringing sunlight into a room without the heat. That was the, the sort of the breakthrough. Okay. And it's interesting because from what I gather, it's, it's uh, you know, it's both full spectrum. It's natural sunlight and uh, supplemental artificial lights, which allow you to drive, you know, photosynthesis to get the healthy plant that you're after. So that's a great starting point. Why don't we start kind of high level? Give us kind of an overview of how the whole system works and, and the unique advantages that it provides as opposed to the regime of artificial stuff that's out there. Sure. And it's a, it's a great cross-reference there, the artificial lighting. The artificial lighting technology that's being used in – cannabis cultivation today, indoor and outdoor, in, in hybrid greenhouses and whatnot. The, the, Jonathan and I refer to those as twilight uh, technologies. There's a certain amount of uh, time that's going to pass before the energy demands and the cost of production are going to catch up with each other, and you're just simply not going to be able to use HID lights, either indoor or outdoor. Um, I don't like to speak poorly about the performance of other competing technologies, but I will say that having been an outdoor grower for my most of my career, I've done indoor, I've done everything in the industry, really. Um, there's nothing like the sun, right? I mean, that's like a cliche to say it, but nothing produces spectacular cannabis quite like the full color and the full power of what the sun is. Sun Grown Zero's systems partnered up with a company called Solitube. Solitube is a daylight, tech, daylight technology system. They bring daylight into an indoor environment. It's been, a uh, company's been operating for almost 30 years worldwide. You'll see them in warehouses, in schools, in office buildings. Um, in fact, at the Dubai Ski Resort, they use the same sky vaults that you see in our demonstration trailer. They bring full no spectrum sunlight into the room and they bring no heat, which means they're not going to melt the snow. <laughs> those, are, those are the same skylights that I bolted onto the top of that trailer and I'm driving around from conference to conference. Okay. So what Jonathan did was he reached out to SolarTube right after, uh, fortunately, right after they developed and designed that large scale 30 inch in diameter sky vault, which is their most, their most powerful and largest uh, daylight system that they have. And he created a relationship with Solotube. Now, the thing about Solotube that has to be remembered is Solotube's goal with their daylight capture technology was to bring the kind of light into an indoor environment that human beings enjoy, right? 
And what are we talking about? We talk about what human beings enjoy. We're not talking about par. We're talking about clean, white, full-color spectrum light. A lot of people always talk about uh, fluorescent lights are kind of in, a, in an office space. For us, fluorescent lights kind of like they, dr they kind of grind everybody down, and the, the color spectrum is all wrong for healthy and human beings. So we'll do one of the problem to solve, wanted to solve that problem. One of the things that's interesting about, interesting about SolarTube is they have found that in schools where they install their daylight technology, which, whichever one of the ones are specced out for those, they're actually engineered for specific facility designs, they found that the students perform better using solar tubes than they do under artificial lights, interestingly enough. So yeah. Jonathan being a scientist and a, a brilliant one at that, he was looking at the cannabis industry, just like me, a guy that enjoys cannabis and has been a part of the industry for many, many years. And he wanted to basically come up with a way he was trying to solve the biggest problem the, the, the industry has, which is its massive carbon footprint. And he stumbled upon SolarTube, reached out to them, created a partnership, and with the DSS company that he created, the research company, uh, got a partner, got some land up in Petaluma, and built an R&D facility using these solar tube sky vaults to bring sunlight in the room. And the first thing he wanted to discover was, can you grow cannabis just with the sky vaults? And he quickly found out that you can. So if you uh, could think about like an outdoor garden, like the one that I had up in Humboldt County, I was able to grow two runs a year in that outgrown outdoor garden. Now, uh, using light deprivation technology, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Now, it, the first run was always about 40 or 50 percent more weight and of a higher quality than the second run, because the first run was essentially May through the end of June into July. So when Jonathan ran those first tests, he was running the May through the end of July runs, and he was using the dimmers that you see activated in our video that show that, that, that set the time at exactly 12 hours, so that the plants stayed in flower through their life cycle and everything. And he, and he found out right away that, yes, with just the solar tube sky balls, you could, you could cultivate absolute A-plus medical-grade uh, quality cannabis. However, if you're going to compete in today's industrialized commercial cannabis industry, you need to be matching the kind of production that an indoor facility has. And they're, they're running – anywhere from four and a half to five and a half uh, harvests per room per year, right? Basically, you do all of right. your cloning and your vegging outside of your flowering rooms, and essentially you put your plants in your flowering room for three to seven days, and then you trip them to 12 hours, and you run them to the end of their life cycle, whether they're a, uh, an OG that takes 11 weeks or a sour diesel that takes 11 and a half weeks or it's a Mr. Nice that might get done in eight weeks, whatever it is for the plant, right? So Jonathan designed uh, uh, intelligent management technology, grow technology, to monitor the sunlight that the solar tube sky bolts were bringing into the room, into the space, and supplement it using uh, the, what he used in the, the test facility was a full-spectrum Helio Spectre LED 300s. And those are, those are variable LEDs, so he was able actually to fine-tune not just the power but also the different color spectrum waves that the plants might have been missing that he was able to monitor using his programming and his IP. And over time, he ran the facility for almost two and a half, maybe almost three years, he was able to continually refine until he came to a point where he was producing somewhere in the range of 35 grams per square foot of absolutely perfect medical-grade, clean, pesticide-free cannabis. And it was right around at the end of that facility design uh, R&D system that he was doing where I met him. <clears throat> I met him at the New West Summit in October of 2016. And I saw his uh, Sky Vault, the one that we're bringing to the Boston AnyCan this week, tomorrow, actually. And I saw his Sky Vault, and I saw his cannabis, actually. He had samples there. And as a proud, almost boastful Humboldt County grower, I was impressed. And, in fact, I was so impressed that I thought that there was no way that he could have done that with the technology that he was showing us. I, I, I basically call bullshit, if I'm allowed to say bad words, I call BS. 
uh, if you want to edit that out. We'll let you get away with it. <laughs> and then I, I did, and I, I reached out to him. We exchanged business cards, and I asked him if I could come see the facility. And he invited me out there to literally <laughs> – I thought I lived in the middle of nowhere. He, <laughs> he practically had to come get me to get me to where he was. I went out there in November. It was a cloudy day, a little bit of sprinkles, no, br- no real bright sunshine at all. And when he opened the door to that R&D facility, he was in full bud, and I reached for my sunglasses. It was so bright in the room. And, and it was the middle of the day, so the LEDs were off. And I was flabbergasted, really. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I actually get, I get, I get goosebumps on the back. I get chills on the back of my neck when I remember how, how I was going there to basically kind of laugh at this guy. And be like, there's no way uh-huh. you're doing what you're doing. You had to bought those. You had to buy this weed here in San Francisco somewhere. It just was, you know, like I've heard since we've been partners over and over again. Too good to be true. Um, right. But it wasn't. It wasn't too good to be true. He was actually. He was everything he was saying was true. And in fact, as a scientist, not being a kind of a natural born salesman like me, he actually I thought undersold it a little bit. When you hear me talk at conferences, I'm a lot more. I'm a lot more uh, uh, bombastic because it really is an absolute revolution. What he's, what he's created and what SunGrown Zero is offering right now is nothing short of a game changer. I fully believe that what we have will be the industry lighting facility standard <clears throat> within five years. Wow. Johnny, why is that? I mean, solar tubes have been around for a while now. What is, why is the technology making its way to cannabis now? I think that <clears throat> I actually I, I brought that question to JC uh, uh, not that long ago. I was like, how come, you know, how did you, how are you the guy? And, you know, you got a combination of things. The company, SolarTube, is a very conservative company. They weren't really excited about having their name. It still aren't uh, excited about having their name uh, connected with the cannabis industry, but certainly – 20 years ago, you had a confluence of different factors that, meant it, that made it really not really worth the bother. The number one factor was 20 years ago, 1996 was when Prop 215 started. That was the year I, I started cultivating two months after Proposition 215 passed in California. Back then, yeah. a pound of cannabis was wholesaling for $6,000 a pound. Nobody, nobody worried about how, how expensive the electricity was for the 1,000-watt bulbs that you were using growing in your apartment. You had two lights or three lights and a spare bedroom in the back. You're making $18,000 every 14 weeks. What do you care if your electricity bill is $400 a month? It meant right. nothing. It wasn't <clears> – <throat> and it wasn't – really. and even moving forward, legitimate, open uh, – uh, out in the open commercial cannabis facility design is only about what seven eight years old, maybe maybe a decade. I don't even think it's been a decade since you've seen these ten thousand, fifty thousand, hundred thousand square foot uh, indoor cannabis cultivation facilities. And so it's only when we started to do two things: one, we started cultivating at scale, and when you start talking about 500,000 watt bulbs, 1,000, 2,000, 100,000 square foot facility would use something in the range of, uh, I think, 60,000. You know what those meters are doing? They're spinning so fast, they have to be replaced every three years. I I was just up in Canada, in Muskaka, and I, I went to a facility that was just being completed. And it was a 60,000-square-foot, two-story HID facility. And I was meeting with the owner, the architect, and the engineer. You know what the engineer told me? That 60,000-square-foot facility needed a landed power of five megawatts. That's like a small town's worth of energy. Yeah. And so – and so – Colorado was really where you started to see these super gigantic indoor facilities. And, that's, and it was around then, seven years ago, six years ago, when you started to read these articles in the different trade publications and then in the regular newspapers talking about, wow, you know, some people estimate that Colorado's cannabis industry is using 3% of all of the electricity in the state. And so 
there's that factor, the conservative nature of the solar tube company. And the other thing is that, as I said before, solar tube systems were designed to bring daylight into a room for human beings. The idea that they could be used to grow plants had to be tested and proven, and a scientist had okay. to do it. Some grower up in the mountains of Humboldt, in fact, there, Jonathan was telling me that multiple people did reach out to solar tube years ago about potentially using their, uh, their uh, solar tubes back then to try to come up with a system where you could grow cannabis without the heat load. But nobody was bringing science to it. Nobody was, you know, analyzing the PAR and uh, using radio spectrograms to check out the actual quality of the, the wavelengths and the full color spectrum and all of the things that are necessary. And uh, okay. that was where the, the breakthrough was, Jonathan. And also it was that he made a partnership with SolarTube where he, he did the research and he shared the data with them. And consequently, they shared their data with him. And that's why SunGrown Zero has the exclusive license, the only license agreement to use the solar tube product in an agricultural setting. If you, wanted to, if you listened to this radio story and you wanted to go to solar tube and get 50 of these and build a building and grow cannabis with them, they would give you our phone number. They would tell them that you have to go through us. And I want to also stress, we're not just talking about light. This is a facility design. There's an entire set of IPs and SOPs that are uh, extremely rigorous and in no way, shape, or form are they a, a, like a, a carbon copy of any other indoor facility design, whether it would be HID, LED, or any combination therein. What we're doing is um, – we used to talk about it when we were up in Humboldt. We would talk about when you are doing indoor, basically you're God. You have to be God. You have to control that environment. And it's an incredibly challenging thing to do using HIDs or even LEDs because that extra heat load doesn't exist in the real world in a cultivation environment. You have to get rid of that heat. Well, what Jonathan yeah. created a system that does. It, it, we, we, without the heat load being in there, we're able to manage that indoor environment, the climate, the, the spectral uh, powers and the spectral waves of the sun and the intensity and the timing and the humidity and all of those things in a way that is, just doesn't exist anywhere. Gotcha. Very interesting. Now, do you guys integrate with Gronetics? At the facility that Jonathan did his R&D, he did uh, partner up with Gronetics. That's the grow intelligence that he used for that uh, program. However, there are multiple different uh, grow intelligence uh, companies out there that can, can potentially be used. If, if, for instance, you came to us and you had been growing HID facility cannabis in wherever, Detroit, and you were familiar with so-and-so's uh, grow intelligence, we could easily uh, work with that design. You wouldn't have to change. We don't have a okay. – we're kind of agnostic on most of the tech other than the sky vault, the solar tube technology. Gotcha. You can use your own HVAC makes... design. You can use your own dehumidifier. You can use your own fans. Uh, we have everything. We have We have an architect, an engineer. We have cultivation management technology that increases production. Obviously, we would choose our specific protocol for every step of the way. We have cultivation facility design and construction and SOPs from ground to roof. However, okay. given the industry has so many existing facilities and so many existing technologies, we have the flexibility to work with just about anything. And part of that solution uh, or one component of the whole system is, is an integrated cloud system, correct? Um, I'm not sure that that's – that's a question I think that's more for, for like, the Gronetics guys. You know, we're not, we're not, we're not putting our, do, our data into the cloud, but I know that some of the, okay. uh, the, intel, the uh, Grow Intelligence Corporations are. But currently that's not part of what we're looking at doing, not to say that we wouldn't in the future, but right now uh – -huh. That seems to me like that's more of a question for, like, uh, the grow intelligence companies than it is for us. We okay. have trade so secrets. The system is really... we have... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm... No, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we have trade secrets and copyrights and trademarks and patent-protected things. And so uh, because we're so unique and so different um, – I'm not sure what I, I'm not sure about the cloud using the cloud for 
for that. Okay. Understood. But it's agnostic enough so that you can integrate with whatever variety of, of different cloud systems there are out there to build this, yeah, I guess, integrated intelligence. C certainly. Certainly. Interesting. So with cannabis, I'm going to show a little bit of my ignorance here, but I wanted to touch on it. Um, you know, I know it still needs dark time to keep its biological clock in check. And I, I wanted to visit, um, and maybe you can explain to our viewers, you know, the need for supplemental LED lights. Or in other words, you mm -hmm. know, these tubular systems are so almost too good to be true. I mean, they're providing the full spectrum of natural daylight, which can't really be replicated. Um, why is there a need for supplemental LED lights? Um, and, and how does that full work? How does that come together? Well, the, the, reason, that it, the reason you need supplemental lights is we're not growing uh, tomatoes one season only. Just plant them in, in uh, May and harvest them in September, and then you're done. You need supplemental light because we're running, excuse me, a commercial indoor cannabis facility. It's a commercial indoor cannabis facility that's harvesting, depending on the size, at a 100,000 square foot facility, you'd be harvesting every week. You'd be harvesting a room every single week, maybe even two. Using our design, uh -huh. you're harvesting every week, whether you have a 10,000 square foot or a 100,000 square foot. So you're growing year round. The quality of the sun and the intensity of the sun changes year round. So the supplemental LEDs are used extremely infrequently in the – if you're talking about California. In California, for the middle eight months of the year, the LEDs are very infrequently being used. Obviously, okay. you get into November, December, January, and February, they're, they're, they're carrying a heavier load. They're bringing in more of the different wavelengths and colors and also more of the intensity. So when you're growing okay. under the, you know, when you have your flowers and you have your flowers under your 12 hours, you have to make sure that they, the plant can endure certain stresses, but there are also certain stresses that cause it to act as if as though its life is threatened. And under those types of stresses, and particularly if it has a, a, a strange confluence of light loss for a period of time and power and color loss and then light intensity comes back, a lot of times the plant will act in a strange way and it'll, it'll hermaphrodite and it'll, 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 pollinate, it'll pollinate itself and create seeds and you'll have crop loss. And so that 12-hour okay. uh, box that you're growing in needs to have some very, very consistent, very, pretty much everything. And also not just during, it's not just about the 12 hours, it's about the life cycle of the plant. When it's, when it's younger, it wants a little more intensity. When it's older, it wants more different colors. And as you're going through its 8- to 11-week flower cycle, our system is constantly monitoring every aspect of what's going on inside that environment, whether it's the age of the plant, uh, the humidity in the room, the color spectrum that the sensors are reading, either on the roof or in the room. And so the supplemental light, base, it's, it's almost like you could say – that the sky vault itself is acting as the control for the supplemental light. That's a more okay. accurate way to describe how it works. So the sky vault is talking to the sensors all the time. And during the 12 hours that it's actually kind of communicating to us through the sensors of what it's giving, our system, our IPs, read that information and add what's missing, depending on what the plant needs at that period of time of its life. And I will say, with, with no hesitation and absolute certainty, there is no other system anywhere that's doing this whatsoever. Nobody else has the type of IPs that we have to do that. No one else is even has it as an option. HIDs does not have this as an option. LED does not have this as an option. And even hybrid greenhouses using supplemental lights that they're using up in Canada primarily, tons and tons, hundreds, millions of square foot of 21-foot tall, you know, uh, Tesla greenhouses using supplemental light to grow year-round. They're not, they're not using the, the IP that Jonathan has created. Gotcha. You explained that really well. I think I understand. Let's move on to some of the SOPs you guys provide. Um, you know, I, I – are they just kind of standard do's and don'ts, or do they go deeper into providing, for example, lighting yeah, they're, profile they're, recipes? 
Yeah, they're far beyond just a detail. They're far beyond do's and don'ts. It's a detailed operation management uh, operation management manual that is basically outlining the ways that you interact with the environment in the room through our grow intelligence programming. Um, it's it's like a it's a complex dynamic timeline specific composition that the SOPs are dictating. Um, in conjunction with our partnership with VSC Group, who has a, a proprietary technology of managing the cultivation. So the, the SOPs that the two of us have combined, the, or what SunGrown will give you, the SOPs are, 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 are going to be unlike anything that's out there now. Um, they contain, obviously, a bunch of our trade secrets. But most importantly, as I said before, we're managing the light system, the light profile in a way that has never been done. And I can say that uh, BSC Group and what they've done in terms of boosting production by bringing the plants from environment to environment to match the needs of the based on the age of the plant. And we are also, our system shortens the life cycle of the flowering plant. So we're able to get six harvests a year instead of four and a half to five and a half. Um, okay. So, you, you're, you're, you know, what we talk about is, we're we're building our flagship down at we're we're looking to build it in Desert Hot Springs. We're going to build a 10,000 square foot flagship facility, and that flagship facility is not just going to be a, a place where we you know profitably grow cannabis uh, and use as a marketing tool, but it's also going to be like a teaching environment. And when you hire us oh, to design and build your facility, when you hire us to design and build your facility, uh, when you get to the point where you're a couple of months away from getting ready to launch your grow team will come to our flagship and work hand-in-hand -hand with our team and learn the ins and outs of the SOPs top to bottom. So we're wow. not just handing you a manual. We're not just handing you a manual and saying, well, you know how to grow. Here's our SOPs. They're pretty much the same as everything you've been doing all this time with a little tweak here and there. No, it's a, we're talking about you have to learn an entire new system. Let's go, back to, let's go back to one of the primary breakdowns there are in the industry today. So we were talking before about how the energy demands of the industry is a huge breakdown and it has to be addressed. It's an issue that cannot be ignored any longer. The other issue that can't be ignored any longer is crop failure. We know for a fact that there's massive crop failures all over the world in, in the cultivation of cannabis that's happening right now. Up in Canada, they're looking at crop failures of, at indoor, uh, of indoor HID facilities of over 30%, and they're above 50% in the, in the greenhouse uh, hybrids right now. Uh, part of that is because they switched, to testing at, they, they switched to testing at parts per billion, but also part of it is the, uh, the, the, the unspoken war that goes on inside every facility design but SunGrown Zero, and that's the unspoken war that you have with heat and humidity. Artificial lights generate massive amounts of heat, which amps up the amount of humidity that's in the room and creates the situations that really foster the growth of molds and mildew. And greenhouses do it as well. In fact, that's where the term greenhouse gas came from. UV and infrared rays go into the space, and they don't reflect out, and they bounce around. They create this huge amount of heat. It's one of the reasons why the Tesla, quote, unquote, of greenhouses are 21 feet tall. The top six feet is just sitting there with this huge ball of hot, wet air that constantly has to be evacuated out of the space. Yeah. Well, the problem, with that, the problem with that is very simple. No matter what you're doing, you're bringing cold air through hot canopy. You are creating the conditions that mold and mildew grow in. It's a petri dish. I get it. Yeah. And so th this, is, this is a huge breakdown. You know, no one even talks about this. I, I was just looking online trying to read articles. The only people writing about it in the United States are the people covering the testing labs. Uh, the, the, the reason I know the, the numbers in Health Canada so clearly is because Health Canada is federally regulating their cannabis, and so they, have, they offer reports and they talk about it. Um, we've, we've completely eliminated that equation. With that, we don't have to deal with that at all. But when you have a cultivator that has mastered growing using 1,000-watt lights in Denver, Colorado, growing sour diesel strains, what you really mean is you have a cultivator that's mastered that specific strain in that specific environment in that specific region of the country using the people that he works with and the nutrients that he uses and the technologies and techniques that he uses. 
That man or woman is very, very resistant to changing any aspect of what's going on in that room because it is a razor-thin edge between failure and success when the monster of mold and mildew is always present. It right. never is gone. And so when you talk about every sixth harvest is going to be a loss, that's practically factored into the business model for HID. For greenhouses, it used to be every third. Up in Canada, it used to be every third. Now it's every other, basically. So, and I've spoken to people in Canada, including some of the important players that are part of the, the federal government, and they're saying to me that virtually no one is growing 100,000-plus square foot of cannabis in Canada and not failing right now. And we already know about the failure rates that are happening in the United States. We know about how many companies have already gone bankrupt in Colorado. We know how many have gone bankrupt in Chicago. We know how many have gone bankrupt in California. It's a, it's a, it's a razor-thin line between success and failure because that specter, that issue of mold and mildew, cannot be removed unless you remove the heat load. We don't have a heat load at all. And so your cultivator comes to our facility and learns our SOPs and masters our systems. And when he goes back to your new facility, your new Sun Grown Zero facility, he's free for the first time in his life as a cultivator to just worry about growing great cannabis. He's not having to worry about, oh, my God, what's my humidity? I need to have the monitors on. I need to have that information coming to my iPhone all night long while I'm home after work. I need to make sure those guys, that, that, that thermostat can't break, and that fan has to work perfectly, on and on and on. At your build-out right. cost, at your build-out cost, you don't have to land five megawatts of power, and you don't have to have, 100 to $125 a square foot HVAC systems put in. You don't have to have, you know, uh, NASA, NASA created dehumidifying systems. All of these things are just expensive band aids to, to address an issue in a technology that was never designed to grow plants in the first place. Greenhouses are a technology. How old are greenhouses? 500 years? Basically, yeah, we built the first greenhouses about four hours after the first person invented flat glass. So, okay. so what, what, that's what I talk about. When I'm talking about a revolution, I'm talking about we are the first brand new indoor cultivation technology that the industry has ever seen. We're the first one specifically designed to grow food, cannabis, or any agriculture can grow using this technology. If you were in an area of the world where you were dealing with the temperatures are rising up so high you no longer can grow the cucumbers that you've always grown or the tomatoes that you've always grown, we could bring our technology to you and you could have the same climate that you've always had even though it's 110 degrees outside. We can bring this to the desert and you can grow in the desert using this technology. We're bringing the full power and color of the sun into the room and none of the heat. It could be 120 John, degrees outside perfect temperature inside our space. Nice. And I'd, I'd like to, great segue to my next question. Um, I want to touch on ROI. You know, what, what do you say to growers who already have, you know, a sophisticated LED system, which seems to be omnipresent? Are, are you able to, yeah. to kind of calculate some numbers? But, you know, it's so early. Um, are you able to do that? Absolutely. We've got, we've got reams and reams of data showing that our, our ROI is the industry best. SGO ROI is somewhere in the range of 24 months. Nobody else is even close to that. Our operating costs are so low that there's, no, there's just no comparison. There's no comparison. Our operating costs are infinitesimal. And, uh, I mean, you're talking about – you're, you're talking about we're, we can cultivate, depending on your geographic location, at somewhere between 6 and 10 watts per square foot. Man. 6 to 10 watts Impressive. per square foot. So, so if your LEDs are at the 35 to 40 watts per square foot, 
we're racing past you. It's like you're standing still with your revenue. Yeah. Forget about HID. <laughs> Forget about HID. HID <laughs> could be up to a hundred dollars, a hundred watts per square foot. We're we're at ninety percent of that. That makes for an easy sell, I would think. Um, why don't we change subject a little bit or shift? I'm curious. You know, the lighting sector is is just massive. I mean, it's it's changing quite quickly with with new advanced LEDs. It goes way beyond cannabis. Let's talk mm-hmm. about cannabis. What are some of the challenges that you guys face um, as a startup in the cannabis space? What's what's kind of surprised you? Yeah, the first, you know, you you the the way you're framing the question is the first challenge, right? The first challenge is that people think that we're a new lighting option, and we're a facility design, not a light. Uh, it's yeah. it's more like the solo tube integration is a lighting control uh, a lighting control system. So that's the first challenge is the second challenge is that we're so brand new and so different than any existing technology that it's very, very tough to explain to people what this is without showing it to them. I had a, I had a conversation with the a gentleman that works for SolarTube earlier in the year, in the beginning of January it was, and we were just riffing. We were talking about conferences that we might go to together and I said, his name is Mike Sather. He's a good friend of, uh, of uh, SunGrown. And I said, Mike, I said, I tell you, the biggest problem I have is I can't believe how many people, when I tell them what this is, they ask me if it's a solar panel. And I'm like, no, it's not a solar panel. Well, is it, is it like a skylight? I said, no, it's not a skylight. Well, do you use it in greenhouses? <laughs> and he laughed. He laughed at me. And he yeah. said, John, you have to understand, solar tube has been around almost 30 years. We figured that out a long, long time ago. We built... We built solo tube facilities all around the world showing the multiple different types of uses and installations that you can use solo tubes for. So that when we were negotiating to do an apartment complex or a school complex or a, a giant warehouse or a, uh, an industrial uh, building, we could bring the people to the facility and see it in action. We could show them what it is. They could go walk in a room or a giant warehouse where the sky vaults are 30 feet above the, the floor, and they could see that it completely and adequately filled the room with light. And uh, I, had a, I actually woke up that night. I had dreamt about building that SunGrown Zero trailer. And over the space of two weeks, I, I got in touch with the Soul Tube guys. I bought a trailer. They shipped out two sky vaults, and we built it in three days, and we brought it to the ICBC conference in San Francisco at the end of January, beginning of February, and we debuted that trailer for the first time. And the response that we've gotten since that, that first debut has been nothing short of a tidal wave, a tsunami of interest and new leads and new opportunities uh, from everywhere. We now have that, that debuted video, plus we, we, brought, uh, we, we revamped the trailer got a really nice shiny paint job on it, and we tightened up some of the little details about it. We just brought it to Oakland to the uh, Cannabis Cultivation 2018 conference uh, two weeks ago and showed it to even more people, and it's been the, it's been the breakthrough. I think that, that that trailer has kind of enabled us to break through that, that fourth wall, if you will. Um, you can yeah, go and see I would the like video to... now. Oh, oh. I just want to interject very quickly. I saw the video. Go ahead. I saw the video you're talking about, and I'd like to make sure viewers, before we leave, know where to go to see that because uh, the video is really impressive. But but please continue. Well, I was going to say is we we so we we went through all this trouble, and we obviously we spent some money to go to this Cannabis 2018 conference. And as we were getting the trailer ready to bring it there, we saw that the uh, the weather reports for those three days were to my team were terrifying because it was like one day sunny, one day cloudy, one day rainy. And I said, guys, no, no, no. This is nothing to be afraid of. This is something to embrace. We now have video. We now have video of people that don't work for me that are cultivators, investors, scientists, cannabis educators, cannabis politicians, legislators, standing inside that space on a cloudy day on a sunny day, and on a rainy day. And you can see 
that the sun is so powerful that it doesn't matter what's happening, that the, the weather is sort of like a, an incidental factor when it comes to the sunlight. Certainly, there would be days when your supplemental light will be working more than it would on a sunny day, and I'm not saying that that's not true. But on that rainy day, people were st standing in a room, and this room just filled with bright white light. They were so amazed. And we have shot after shot of people laughing with joy that they can't believe their eyes or people saying, I can't even believe this. This is amazing. People using their own measurement tools, people using lumens meters and PAR meters to go, this is incredible. This is more power. I had a guy do a lux meter on a cloudy day and say at three feet we had more lux than HID does at three feet. And that was on a cloudy day. Nice. So that was, you know, we really feel like that, that we've begun to beat back that one last kind of challenge. The one challenge was really what is it? And by, by designing and building this trailer, which we're going to be at the Coachella Valley, Coachella Valley Conference uh, April 6th and 7th, we're looking to potentially be at MGJ Biz in Vegas. We're going to be at the Okana Biz Conference June 6th, 7th, and 8th in Toronto with the trailer. Um, you'll be able to see it all over at all these different conferences all over North America over this next calendar year. And uh, our proof of concept is uh, winning the day. Yeah, and I would think with time, John, as, as people begin to see it for themselves, that, that you know, those barriers are just going to come down. Um, so given all that you've got going on with Sun Grown Zero, um, what are the things that we can look at, look to, for the rest of the year. You mentioned earlier about a flagship facility you're building. Can, can you touch on what we can expect over 2018? I would think – I'll tell you what the plan is. Now, I'm a, I'm a plan guy, and I've yeah. worked in the construction industry since I was 13 years old. Before I was in cannabis, I was building restaurants all over San Francisco, restaurants doing tenant improvements. Um, our plan is to break ground on our 10,000 square foot uh, flagship somewhere in the Desert Hot Springs area, potentially in Cochillan itself. You know Cochillan Business Park, Cannabis Business Park, that's going to be built down there. Are you aware of I that? I know of it. I know 160 it. 160 acre. Uh, disruption technology cannabis business park. It's going to have a restaurant and a cannabis store and a bud uh, cafe. And, and we have a couple of uh -huh. different partners that we're negotiating with to potentially build our flagship there. We also have a couple of others in the Desert Hot Spring area that we might go with. My plan would be that we'd be breaking ground by end of June. Um, we have an excellent architect in Cusimano Architects out of Toronto is our architect and his engineer partner, Jerry Mobilio. Um, we have a, a, a way of building, a plan to build that is incredibly lightweight, flexible, scalable, and very quick. So I would think if we're breaking ground in June, I would think by June of 19, we'd probably be uh, starting our first harvests, our first uh, plants in there. Um, also part of that game plan is uh, we're hoping to get some news media to cover, the obviously, the launch of the, of the facility. But we're negotiating to do installations with cultivators all over North America as we speak. So we may be doing – you may be seeing Sun Grown Zero uh, up in Toronto, in Vancouver. Um, we're going to the NECAN in Massachusetts. Massachusetts new regulations of 36 watts per square foot for uh, cannabis cultivation, I mean, that's at the very upper limit of what an LED system can do. They can, they're right at between 30 and 40 watts, depending on design. We're going to be between 6 and 10. So for all intents and purposes, Massachusetts just legislated the only cultivation system you can use in that state is Sun Grown Zero. And, you know, that's, that's, there's going to be more of that. There are already uh -huh. municipalities in California that are saying you're not allowed to put in 1,000-watt uh, bulb cannabis cultivation facilities. They're saying you have to be indoor, but you can't be landing 5 megawatts to your facility because it's too much. Yeah. So um, we, 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 we expect to see a lot, of, uh, a lot of momentum pointing towards Sun Grown Zero from municipalities and states and 
potentially even whole countries. Um, I'd also like to mention when you were talking, I didn't get to this before, and you can maybe fold this back into the ROI conversation. Our ROI sure. conversation, the numbers that I'm talking about, do not include uh, rebates from energy companies and tax rebates for energy efficiency in your uh, in your facility design. Ah. Okay. And those change, they, they change municipality to municipality, state to state, uh, in some cases county to county. But, it, but given, the, given the fact that our, our base flagship design will, uh, uh, will apply for and will qualify, qualify for LEED certification, LEED certification is Leadership and Energy Efficient Design. It's an architects-generated uh, system of rewarding uh, companies that build, that design and build uh, uh, buildings, facilities, schools, offices, whatever they are, building them with the most, uh, the least amount of carbon footprint impact as possible, whether it's in terms of the materials that you use or your energy use, your recycling, your supplemental power, whether you use uh, solar panels, the type of blacktop you use in your uh, parking lots and all of that. So we have a design for our flagship, completely scalable at 10,000 square foot. It could scale up to a million square foot without a problem. And it will apply for and qualify for LEED certification anywhere in North America. Differences, and the reason I say will apply and qualify differently, if you're in a super hot zone, place an area that has 300 days of light a year, like California or Arizona, we think we can qualify for platinum LEED certification, which is the absolute best, highest uh, uh, honor that you can have. I think on the East Coast and in Toronto, I think we'd be more getting silver or bronze just because the amount of supplemental light needed in an area that doesn't have 300 days might uh, make it a little harder for us to get the energy efficiency rating. But nonetheless, it's still, uh, we're still, we're still breaking the mold. I mean, we're completely breaking the mold when sure. it comes to energy use. Sure. John, this has been an education and an outstanding interview. Not, not only, for me at least, not only in natural lighting solution systems that you're, you're built, but, but in grow lighting in general. Um, so I want to make sure our listeners know where to go to learn more about yes. Sunburn Zero and, and who to contact um, for more information. So the, first, the, the answer to the first question is, Go to a, a Sungrown Zero page online that would give you absolutely oodles and oodles of information. You would start with going to info. Okay, you go to www.sungrownzero.com. That's www.sungrownzero.com. You can co- you can contact us. You can contact contact. You can contact us at info at sungrownzero.com. You can email me directly at john at sungrownzero.com. That's J-O-H-N. Um, and we have a Sungrown Zero YouTube channel. It's a little bit tougher to read out to you, but it's uh, http uh, colon forward slash forward slash B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash S-G zero videos. But if you go to sungrownzero.com, it links to everything. Really great stuff, John. I'll be watching you and Sungrown Zero for 2018 and beyond. I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate it, too. Thanks, Rob. That's it, everyone. Thanks for listening. See you next time.